Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Timmer. Welcome to Lunch with Lincoln. It is, uh, I guess it's afternoon in half of the country and it's it's morning in the rest. Uh, let's begin uh, today's show by looking at a recent ad from the Lincoln Project. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the screamers, the criminals, the carnival barkers and their loyal clowns. The ones who don't like differences. They hate the rules and they have no respect for you. You can't reason with them or disagree with them. They glorify villains and vilify heroes. About the only thing you shouldn't do is ignore them because they have a plan to push America backwards and while some may see them as crazy, we know they're dangerous. Because if we don't fight, the people who are crazy enough to think they can stop progress will. Now, I'm especially glad today to be joined by Dan Barkoff. Uh, Dan is a to me, a real life, uh, you know, action hero. He is, has an amazing background and has been a true leader in the fight uh, to preserve American democracy. Uh, Dan, welcome to Lunch with Lincoln. It's great to have you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, excited to be here. You know, uh, Dan is the president of an organization called Veterans for Responsible Leadership. And Dan, why don't you tell our viewers bit about the the organization the work you're doing how you got involved the you know the the whole 10,000 foot uh, story yeah absolutely jeff so um so vfrl started in 2017 pretty pretty quickly after trump was inaugurated and um i was kind of you know an anti trumper from the beginning um and it started as a facebook group and the Facebook group was largely other military veterans, uh, friends of mine. And, um, you know, one of the things uh, that, you know, all military veterans know is that a sizable percentage of, of folks get out and go to law school. And some of the lawyers in the group were like, hey, we should just incorporate and uh, a Google search on how to form a super PAC. And, and then we then we did it. Um, and so, you know, we we've had about uh, we've got about 8000 members. Um, we've done some super PAC stuff. Our, our, our particular interest is in races involving veterans. Um, you know, we've supported both Republicans and Democrats at times, although, you know, with, uh, post January 6th and, and things like that, it's pretty hard to support, uh, some of the Republicans or, or really any Republicans unless they, they really disavow some of the things that their party has done. Um, so, you know, this, this cycle, what we're looking at, uh, mostly is Virginia. Uh, we're very interested in Virginia two and Virginia seven, um, Abby Spanberger and Elaine Luria, mm -hmm. uh, both terrific, terrific Congress people. Uh, and we're, we're excited to support them down there. Also looking a little bit at the, uh, the Senate races. Um, there's a couple bad actor veterans that we think our boys can sort of uniquely, uh, target, um, JD Vance in Ohio. And, and if he makes it through the primary area, Greggins in Missouri. Now, when I mentioned uh, Dan has this, you know, action hero background, Dan is a, a Navy SEAL, uh, a combat veteran, uh, medical doctor, uh, and like, you know, warrior in the fight for democracy. So I don't know how you find time to do this all. Um, there's so many things that we could talk about today. Uh, after watching the news this weekend, you, yeah. Americans do what we do, and that's we act horrified about these mass shootings, but then we really don't do anything about it. You know, there was, the, of course, the, the Buffalo shooting seems to be the marquee shooting of the weekend. Uh, there were three other mass shootings, um, and everybody is aghast at them. But other than being aghast, we kind of set aside these... Uh, uh, we, we say, oh, the NRA is too powerful. We whine about the NRA instead of focus on winning against the NRA. Uh, you, you mentioned something to me in our conversation preparing for the show that there's a, uh, 
a, a correlation uh, between the end of, of combat and uh, increased risk or potential for violence. And I just wanted to explore that a little more. Not that, you know, we, I don't know that we had veterans involved in any of the shootings this weekend. I don't know if that's been determined yet. But it, it is the, the increase of, of violence in our society and the acceptance of violence in the society is a, a sociological uh, phenomenon that none of us should be comfortable with. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a known phenomena uh, among social sciences, and, and it's really um, uh, something that, that academics are, are pretty well aware of. Now, there's always this debate of, of causation versus uh, association, but um, you know, if you take the most successful domestic terrorist movement ever, um, which historically has been the Ku Klux Klan, the, uh, the Klan had kind of three waves. So it had a wave, uh, the initial wave um, was after the Civil War, you know, where if you've read anything about the Klan, you know about Nathan Bedford Forrest, and it was this, you know, night riding organization to, to really deal with uh, reconstruction and, and uh, you know, black enfranchisement and things of that nature. Um, the second major wave of the Klan was um, in the 1920s, 1930s. This is when 10% of the state of Indiana was a Klan member. This is, you know, 20 million members. Um, they're at the, the Democratic National Convention. And that wave of the Klan was really, really led by a Spanish-American war veteran. And then you've got the third wave of the Klan, the one that, you know, is more contemporary. We're talking about the 50s, the 60s. We're talking about uh, lynchings down south, the murder of civil rights workers, um, you know, the, the, the story of Mississippi burning. Right. And, you know, that was that was founded by a, a, a Korean war veteran was the, the you know, and, and we have this. You know, even in our own time, even in modern times, um, you know, some of the most incredible acts of violence uh, that domestic terrorists have perpetrated have, have been veterans. I mean, you've got Randy Weaver, uh, you know, at Ruby Ridge, you've got Timothy McVeigh, um, you know, you've got January 6th in which a sizable proportion of the people who stormed the Capitol were, were military veterans. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons one could sort of speculate as to why that is, but the, uh, the fact remains is there's a lot of vets. I mean, Jeff, I know you're up there in Michigan, and, uh, you know, the, the plot against Governor Whitmer with, uh, I think there were two or three Marine Corps veterans were involved in that. So it's, it's something that's very, very real. And as we come out of a 20 year cycle of warfare, um, with an all volunteer military, you know, that, it, that I think that there, um, there are parts of having an all volunteer military that lead directly towards, uh, you know, long-term fascism and, and some of these violent tendencies. So certainly not all veterans are like that, but um, you know, many veterans get out of military service, they go home to their towns and they get radicalized. You know, they're, they're looking for something. Um, you know, people talk about this. Sebastian Younger wrote a great book called Tribe. You know, you get out of the military and you feel alone and you miss that tribe and your buddy, you know, it starts as your buddy saying, let's go shoot some guns in the woods. And next thing you know, you're planning to, to kidnap Governor Whitmer. So it's a known phenomenon. It's, um, and, and I think you're right. The, the shooter in Buffalo this weekend was a pretty young, uh, you know, someone with no prior military service. But even in that, I mean, if you look at the arrest photos, you know, he's he's lionizing military service. He's wearing camis. He's where he wore body armor. He wore a helmet. He carried the weapon that uh, the same weapon, essentially, that I carried overseas. You know, he um, was wearing uh, a shirt that had a slick torso so he could wear a body armor over it. I mean, he he really clearly was affected by this this martial worship that has become so much of our society. You use the term domestic terrorism, and, and using the, the terrorism label is something that I think is very apt, uh, yet so many people are reluctant to do it. And the coverage of these events, uh, the, the media is so reluctant to do it. It seems like we've got to get past this psychological hurdle uh, in our, 
in our minds, in the collective culture, uh, before we're going to actually confront this in a way that we that we should. If this was an act of foreign terrorism, the national response would be far, far different. Just the, 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 the immediate psychological reaction would be just so, so different. Yet here we have another weekend where, you know, I, Laguna Beach, uh, was it Raleigh, Durham? I don't even know where the shooting in North Carolina was. There's a shooting in Houston. It's just and, 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 and. We get so used to it. And we're, it's, it's, it all stems from the same umbrella, this, this, this radicalized, uh, it, it, it's really in, in the construct, the way it's, it's implemented, no different than the way groups like ISIS radicalized you know, young uh, uh, Muslims in the Middle East. It, 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 it the, 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 the construct is the same. The effect is the same. The, 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 the intent is the same to, to terrorize, to disrupt. Uh, you know, there's the, um, it really is something that, that, we're, we're looking at it as a crime problem, but it's, it's, it's so much more than that. Absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's telling that you point out ISIS. Um, it's not that the cause is the same, right? You know, one is Islamic theocracy and one is white supremacy in, in America, but, but the methods are almost identical. So, you know, the, uh, um, the way this, this shooter in Buffalo appears to be, to have been radicalized was through, you know, chat rooms, the 4chan, um, you know, and that's not dissimilar to the way that uh, ISIS got Western recruits. Um, if you look at, you know, Western recruits from Canada, from America, who went, who actually traveled to the Islamic State and took part in, you know, the, the savagery that they were a part of, it really was uh, chat rooms. You know, it was, it was jokes. It starts as jokes. It starts as racist memes. It starts as, um, you know, trying to uh, make fun of uh, immigrant groups and, and African Americans and things like that. And then, you know, one thing leads to another. And before long, you've got someone writing a 180 page, you know, diatribe about about what they why they think what they're doing is right. Um, it seems like to me that the, the you know, the, of many of the methods that are being used to recruit these people are essentially identical. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is. It, I think we as Americans, we as the, the collective us need to be willing to confront some things about ourselves. One is that we're not willing to force and demand the kinds of change in gun laws uh, that would not eliminate instances like this, but reduce instances like this. We're not willing, for whatever reason, to label uh, this this effort. Uh, we, we look at it as these isolated incidents as, as opposed to a, a collective phenomenon. And it, and it really is something that in order for us to truly combat, it seems like we're, we need some, some national leadership on this. And, you know, whether this comes from the White House or, or someplace else, we need a collective reset because we are looking at this as as these, okay, here's a you know, the, the the law enforcement in Buffalo responds to this, and then the law enforcement in Houston responds to this, and the, it, we're we're dealing with this at the very at the the, the 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 isolated tactical level as opposed to the major causation level, and changing how we as a country, how we as a people, how we as a culture are willing to tolerate is really about what we're willing to tolerate, and so far, whether we like it or not, I think that we've decided we're we're willing to tolerate this yep. because it's gone on for years and nothing ever changes. We say thoughts and prayers. That's almost become a joke now on, on yep. online, you know, okay, your thoughts and prayers, but we get outraged and we get, we move on and then it happens again. And we don't demand that anything ever 
be different. We don't respond. We don't demand that there be a collective law enforcement, uh, national law enforcement approach, a strategic approach to this. Um, we didn't demand it after Oklahoma City or anything else. It's it's been going. This isn't new. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. But the prevalence, the 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 rapidity of of this is is that's what's increasing. And I think that the danger uh, we now have this kind of uh, cocktail of of circumstances, the perfect storm, we've got a radical political movement. We don't have two political parties anymore. We have one radicalized political movement that is decidedly authoritarian as opposed to being a political party. And mm -hmm. you've got this, this um, media and online ecosphere that's perpetuating language like this. I said this weekend on Twitter that the the manifesto could also in many ways of the buff, the manifesto of the Buffalo shooter could in many ways be the template for the websites for many Republican candidates. And it's not a joke. It's 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 the the language, the rhetoric, the us versus them kind of mentality, this whole white replacement theory, the the the, the white nationalism. We need to be willing to confront this and call it out, or we're gonna have to uh, be willing to accept this is gonna become more prevalent than it is today. Yeah, absolutely. And so the rhetoric around events like this um, just comically refuses to address the problem. Um, you know, the, the thing that's unique about American culture is guns, right? I mean, other countries have radicalized uh, individuals. Other countries have radical movements. They don't have the level of mass shootings that we have. And that's the thing that we have that's unique. And, you know, it's, it's in the constitution, you know, I, it's hard for me to, you know, when all the two a folks, right. I mean, and I'm being quite serious here. I mean, they, you know, they say it's in the constitution. It's their constitutional right. It, it is in the constitution and I'm not sure what to do about it, but it's going to take a hard discussion, um, you know, to see if the, if the juice is worth the, worth the squeeze on this one, right? Like what do we get as a country out of having everyone have guns? And, and I'm a gun owner. I like to go shoot. I like to hunt. Um, you know, but it's, is it worth it at this point? I mean, the, the hardcore 2A people are going to stand up and they're going to say, Hey, this is so I can overthrow the government, which I always find laughable by the way. Cause I mean, good luck with your Daniel defense against a tank, but you know, the, um, it's, it's a, it's almost a design, you know, it's almost a design issue in, in the, the constitution. I mean, muskets and a well-organized militia uh, or well-regulated militia, right? Like that's, that was then and, and times have changed. So until we're willing to address, uh, you know, the, the major difference between us and other countries, this is going to keep happening. And so, I mean, we've made progress on some of that stuff, you know, uh, red flag laws, um, that type of stuff is honestly addressed more towards, uh, you know, domestic violence and things like that, which is a huge problem. Don't, don't hear that as me criticizing that, but you know, we are, we do have an ability to kind of make change when we want to, you know, the original kind of anti-government thing that, you know, caught, caught my attention as a, as a young man was Timothy McVeigh, right? So after McVeigh bombed Oklahoma city, so McVeigh and, and Terry Nichols bombed Oklahoma city using an ammonia nitrate bomb, the federal government literally changed the composition of fertilizer in Americans. And they went up against the farm lobby and they said, you know, we're going to make it so you can't have as much, you know, you can't have a critical amount of ammonia in your bomb or sorry, in your fertilizer. So people can go make bombs. Um, and, you know, it, they've had terror uh, attempts of people trying to sneak fertilizer over from Canada, literally to, to make these ammonium nitrate bombs. So, you know, that's an example of a time the federal government like actually addressed the means um, that people had, you know, the ability. They, they didn't want any more truck bombs, so they got rid of ammonium nitrate. Now, guns, um, there's nothing about ammonium nitrate in the Constitution, but, you know, there is about firearms. So um, until we have like real political courage, um, it's it's a staggeringly impossible task to, to really make headway on this issue. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears uh, a little bit here. And you, you mentioned the the two congressional races in Virginia and the uh, the Greitens uh, Senate race in in Missouri. What kind of activities is um, 
uh, your group doing there? What uh, kind of coalitions are you participating in? Uh, how do you how are you making a difference on the ground in these states? Yeah. Um, so great question, and happy to talk about it. So you know. Elaine Loria is a congresswoman. She's on her third, you know, she's running for a third term um, out of Virginia Tidewater area. So we're talking Hampton Roads area uh, with redistricting. They actually carved out Norfolk out of her district. Norfolk uh, leans heavily blue, uh, large African-American population. They left her with, you know, Virginia Beach, parts of the Eastern Shore, uh, which is a little bit, her district got a little redder. Um, and the guy she's probably going to go up against with Jerome Bell is a, just an absolute whack job. Um, he was a Navy chief, uh, did he retired out of the Navy, um, and is very, very much uh, as MAGA as they come. Um, you know, his his claim to fame. Um, he's been up on stage at Mar-a-Lago with Donald Trump. <clears throat> His uh, his claim to fame is calling for the execution of poll workers from 2020 who, you know, for the election fraud. Um, that's what he wants to see done. He's, he's been offered chances to literally rescind that. And he said, no, 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 I stand by my statement that, you know, poll workers who committed election fraud need to be executed um, for treason. He is crazy. He has no plan whatsoever for Tidewater, Virginia, other than to, you know, pledge fealty to Donald Trump. Um, Abby Spanberger, uh, or sorry, back to Luria. I mean, Luria's on the January 6th committee. She's on the House Armed Services Committee. She is a great voice uh, for a region of the country that has the largest naval base in the world. Mm -hmm. um, Abby Spanberger, her district is kind of suburban, Northern Virginia from kind of the DC suburbs down to uh, the Richmond suburbs. And um, her district largely stayed, uh, stayed the same. Um, but she's another one who's kind of in a pretty purple district. Uh, she's a former CIA veteran. She was CIA ops too. She wasn't, um, not that there's anything wrong with being an intel officer, but she wasn't sitting at Langley and, and uh, you know, looking at reports from the field. She was out there doing it. Um, and so those are the two races that we've, uh, you know, definitely are going to play in. Um, and the thing we have is veterans. We have, you know, we, we're a mom and pop shop. We still got our one paid employee who gets 20 bucks an hour. And, you know, but we have a bunch of veterans who want to go on camera and speak their mind and talk about why they want these people to represent them. And then on the Senate side, uh, you know, Brighton's and, and Vance, um, you know, Vance and Vance versus Tim Ryan is going to be kind of the marquee, uh, you know, Senate race this cycle. Um, there's going to be millions and millions of dollars spent on that. Um, Vance uh, was Marine Corps. He worked in public affairs. Um, to JD's credit, I will grudgingly give him credit that he's not running as a, you know, he's not showing Marine Corps logo on, on every single campaign advertisement, but he's, you know, he's doubled down on the MAGA stuff. He's anti-Ukraine. He says he doesn't care about Ukraine. You know, they can all die. Um, you know, he's, he's really drank the Kool-Aid, um, which brings me to Greitens, who is uh, just my favorite charlatan of all time. Eric Greitens is a uh, Duke Rhodes Scholar, um, was uh, wrote three books about his humanitarian work and uh, had a picture of Bobby Kennedy on his dorm room wall. True, true story. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was his idol growing up. Um, you know, realized that he, being from Missouri, he couldn't win office as a Democrat. So he just switched. He just said, oh, yeah, sure, I'm a Republican now and um, resigned as governor after credibly sexually assaulting a hairdresser um, and then, uh, you know, continue to have a, an affair with her while married with two kids, um, loses custody of his kids. His wife is, uh, you know, they're, they're in a custody battle now where she's saying he uh, abused their children, um, stolen money from uh, veterans charities. And in fact, resigned, Jeff, not even because not even necessarily because of the fact that he committed rape. He resigned because uh, he was going to have to give up information on his dark money donors. Um, he's a unique sort of, uh, I think he's the most dangerous Republican in America, and, and I'm aware of Ron DeSantis. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the 
being Missouri, people look at that as a red state and that that Senate seat is likely to be red. Uh, Greitens is the kind of uniquely awful character who can uh, jeopardize that seat for for the Republicans. I know that Mitch McConnell world is petrified uh, that he's their nominee. They don't know what to do about it, that he's going to likely be their, their nominee. Um, and th that is a, it's, it's a long shot that a Democrat wins in Missouri, but my God, it, it, you're right. I mean, I've paid attention to, to Greitens and the, 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 the it wasn't, you know, the whole sexual assault story. I mean, he, there was extortion, there was tying up, <laughs> there yep. was nude photos, there was extortion. Uh, the the charges from his uh, estranged wife or ex-wife uh, about the physical abuse, uh, the mental abuse. The it, this guy is a is like a movie villain. Uh, he's he's just that bad, and so it really seems like uh, that's the kind of race that uh, I think there's there's a um, the Republicans are offering a target rich environment of kooks and wackos, uh, but they're more of the garden variety mega type in most cases. They're nonetheless, you know, is, the, is the ad that we set the stage with, uh, the Lincoln Project ad, they're, they're, they're dangerous, but this guy is uniquely, he, he, he's, a, he, he's a, a, a true villain. He is. And he, he, you know, from, uh, from an early age, I mean, there, there are newspaper articles where he's in like fourth grade saying, I'm going to be the president someday. You know, that's, that's kind of what he's trying to do. Um, you know, Eric is, so he was a buds class ahead of me, um, in, in the SEAL teams. Um, he spent literally nine months in the SEAL teams and then became a White House fellow and, and disappeared. Um, his, his wartime record is one of exaggerations and outright falsehoods. Um, you know, but he is, he's a guy who now his entire strategy is to get Donald Trump's endorsement. Uh, it's so, I mean, apparent he, he hires Kimberly Guilfoyle. He flies to Arizona for this bullshit audit just to get Trump's, you know, to like him. Um, he goes shooting, you know, shoot steel from the seven yard line with Don Jr. And, you know, everything about him is just, I got to get Trump's endorsement. That's his play. That's the only way that this, this works out for him. What's interesting about it is the backstory of Greitens' patron saint in Republican politics is uh, a gentleman named Mike Pence. And uh, I don't know if you heard anything about, about Mike Pence and Donald Trump, but they're no longer uh, great friends. And so the, um, you know, it, it's almost a psychological, uh, it, it's almost like an interesting story of, of psychology where, uh, you know, can Greitens convince Trump to endorse him when Trump knows that Greitens is Pence's boy, it's a really, uh, you know, kind of this bizarro world where none of these issues affect voters whatsoever. There's no platform. It's just as, you know, can Eric convince Donald Trump that, you know, he's not Mike Pence's buddy anymore? That's the whole race. Well, I think you're, uh, you guys are doing great work on the ground in these races. There's one race uh, here in Michigan, a high-profile congressional race, uh, that pits uh, uh, former intelligence officer uh, Alyssa Slotkin yeah. uh, against a recently retired 20-year veteran, uh, military veteran uh, named Tom Barrett, who currently serves in the state Senate. And Barrett is uh, not as overtly uh, a villain like a, an Eric Greitens, but he is a crazy, dangerous, uh, nonetheless, because he puts on the veneer of normalcy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but underneath it would be willing to sacrifice democracy and our election integrity and everything else. And it, there's, there's, I know there's other races like that across the country, uh, that, uh, where there's, uh, um, uh, veterans involved uh and th there's many cases in most cases where the veterans are the good actors mm -hmm. um but there's many many instances like the uh um Virginia 2 or Michigan uh, 7 now uh, with Alyssa Slotkin and Tom Barrett, where the veterans and the MAGAs are the villain uh, actors in this uh, in this election year uh, script that we're following. So, you know, the old uh, and, and I realize, right, like I 
personally, you know, this is this is an advantage to to me and what I'm trying to do, right? But like, stop electing people just because they were in the military, please. For the love of all that is holy, stop just electing bio candidates. It is irrelevant what someone did in the military. It is not the same as being a legislator. You know, don't vote for someone because they have a bunch of pictures, of them in a pretty uniform. It is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, um, I know we are running out of time. I want to thank Dan Barkoff for joining us this week. I want to tell everybody to watch a new show uh, from Lincoln Project called The Game We're In. And uh, you'll be able to watch that uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern time uh, this week with Maya May and Trig V. Olson. They'll be discussing uh, the Pennsylvania and North Carolina uh, the, the North Carolina primaries, uh, that is tonight at, at 7 PM. Uh, forgive me, not, uh, not Wednesday at, at 7 PM. So, uh, um, be sure to tune into that show. There's some going to be some very, very smart analysis about what's going to be happening tomorrow in Pennsylvania and, and North Carolina. So thank you for joining us on Lunch with Lincoln. Tune in again Wednesday at noon or Friday at noon. Um, and, uh, uh again next Monday. Goodbye. Thanks, Jeff.